Lord. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others. Some they beat, and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. For they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray once more. Heavenly Father, this, the reading of your word, is sufficient for us. But you say through the foolishness of preaching, you will magnify yourself. You will sanctify us. You will bring people into the kingdom by the powerful working of your spirit in conjunction with the word of God. And so we pray for your glory in all those avenues and however else you see fit to deal with us, your servants today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So our title today is The Wickedness of Men and the Kindness of God. This is uh, the parable of the vineyard. Uh, Jesus is still in the temple. Uh, This is the last week uh, before the cross. He's had the triumphal entry. He's cleansed the temple. He's still in the temple. He's been approached by the chief priests and the scribes uh, and the elders and these folks, and they've asked him, why, you know, by what authority do you do these things? And, and who gave you this authority? Who do you think you are? Um, and Jesus is basically, well, answer me a question first. You ask me two questions, I'll, I'll, if you can answer my one question, I'll answer your question. And they didn't know what to do. Uh, and it became an authority issue. Uh, who says? Who's the boss? Those types of things. And now, following in line with the end of Mark 11, in which Jesus is interacting with those same authority figures, the religious leaders, who also were the uh, civil leaders and could do anything and had been given permission by the Romans to do basically anything with the Jews they wanted to except for capital punishment, have been rebuffed by Jesus in the temple in front of thousands of people. These are the men that Jesus had said would uh, arrest him and, um, and put him to death. And now he is having these interactions with these particular men sent from the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews at that time. And Jesus is interacting with them and they want to Uh, their hearts are in opposition to Jesus. 
And so the context is in the midst of this Passover time. There is a lot of, I'm sure, anxiety among the disciples. And there is a lot of interest among the people. The triumphal entry had happened. Hosanna, blesses he who's come in the name of the Lord. And then this march of people and uh, authoritative positions and rulers, uh, movers and shakers. The rich, most of these people were rich from the Sadducean uh, camp. Uh, and they could say, go here and do that, or you're in or you're out. And everybody had to do what they had to say. But Jesus puts up opposition to them, and they don't like it. And so as we pick up there from the end of Mark 11, in that very moment when he says, well, neither will I tell you by whose authority I do this. And now, now in that same moment, he begins to tell them, a parable. So look at verse 1 and 2. He began to speak to them, that is, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. And when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. Now, Jesus, this is not the first time that he has told parables to his listeners. He has done it multiple times throughout the book of Mark. But this is the first time, having entered into Jerusalem, that he actually begins to teach in parables. So I remind you, why did Jesus teach in parables? And the reason is, is that there is a hiddenness to a parable in which Jesus is actually inviting uh, inquiry from people who actually want to invest in him, his teaching, and the meaning of the parable. And for those who don't really care at all or are uninterested, they are blinded and shielded from the real meaning of the parable. So there is a truth here in which Jesus is inviting the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, and anybody else into a deeper understanding of what's actually going on. Now, sometimes Jesus would make up a parable. He was a great teacher. He had an understanding of uh, God's people and the word of God and how to instruct, and he had lots of parables that he, he taught, but this particular parable is based on the word of God. And so what he begins to do is to help these, um, these men who have come to oppose him. He wants to help them find and be rooted in their place in redemptive history in this moment. And so what he begins to do is he begins to tell them a story based out of Isaiah chapter 5. So we've got it here. I'm going to read it to you. And if, if, wait, if you can. Okay, so this is, this is where this parable comes from. He's going to use the context of that parable, and he's going to shape it for his listeners. So follow along, Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the, clown, the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. 
For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So as Jesus begins to teach these religious leaders about why he's doing what he's doing and they're in opposition to him he tells them a parable about the judgment of God's people because of their unrighteousness their unfruitfulness and he's beginning to tell it to those who have the most power and authority. Number one, to be conformed to the image of the Lord, to be called according to the purpose for which they had been called and raised up. He's actually giving them a moment to repent. For them to hear this parable and to think about the book of Isaiah, which I guarantee these men had memorized. To say, oh, Lord, help me. I see myself in this place. I am one of those people. I am one of those people who is unfruitful and unprofitable. And I have perpetrated unrighteousness upon the entire nation. And so now we have fallen falling into the judgment of God. Lord, let it not be like in the days of the Babylonian captivity. Break our hearts. Come and grant us a spirit of repentance. That is what Jesus is going to begin to tell them. He's going to impress upon them with this parable. Now in our text, in Mark chapter 12, we'll go back there for a moment. In, in, in this particular text, notice that the owner preps everything well. He desires to have a profitable vineyard. He desires for it to produce the fruit uh, that, that will come from that ground. And so what does he do? He plants a vineyard. He puts a fence around it. It's going to keep out wild animals. It's going to keep out uh, robbers and thieves. It's going to just be this well-protected garden like Eden. And he digs a pit for the wine press. He builds a tower so that people can watch over it and see enemies coming or see wild animals approaching and to have plenty of time to have a course of action and a defense. And then he, after he's got this beautiful garden, this beautiful vineyard, then and only then, after it's well prepared, does he lease it to tenants. So you can picture the Garden of Eden. He prepares this garden and then he places Adam and Eve in this garden to keep and tend it. Now if you were to go back and you were to look at the Hebrew from uh, that particular point of Genesis, those words are only used one other time together in the Bible and it's got direct correlation with worship. So Adam and Eve, as they kept and tended the garden, as they walked with the Lord in the cool of the day, as they fellowshiped with him, it was a, the totality of their lives was, a, was a, an expression of worship of Almighty God. And God had given them the garden to keep and tend it and to make it profitable and truly and really to expand the Garden of Eden beyond the boundaries that they were in at that moment to make the entire earth a place that worshiped and honored and served the Lord. Now we know what happened to Adam and Eve. They rebelled against the Lord and all of humanity fell in them. And then in the history of redemption, God calls out for himself a people. Uh, the Israelites, the Jews, not because they were great or they were wise or they were smart or they were powerful, but because they were small and insignificant and the Lord wanted to glorify himself as their king and Lord. But he did want to call them to renewal and faithfulness and obedience in the worship of the true and the living God. 
And so we have here in application, number one, that the Lord has created in, in, with the crea creation and given to humanity this wonderful vineyard. But in particular, because the Jews in redemption reflect this from Isaiah chapter 5, there is this renewal in which he's given them a second chance, so to speak, to call the nations to worship the true and the living God through his oracles, through his teaching, through his word, through his commandments to, to display this is what it looks like to live in harmony and in relationship with God Almighty. Come and join us. Come and dwell underneath his uh, sovereign kindness and mercy and grace. But they had not done that. They had not done that. They had actually abused, just like Adam and Eve, the privilege that they had as God's people. And so in verse 2, God has now come to get what he deserves as the owner. And so when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. He has prepped the vineyard. He's done everything necessary for the vineyard so that it would be productive and fruitful. And then he waits. He waits to allow the tenants to do what it is that they're going to do. And he only comes and asks for his portion at the right time. Not too early so as to set them up for failure. No, at just the right time. Does does the owner of the vineyard come in season and only some of the fruit, not all of the fruit? Because this day and time, this was a very normal way in which owners and tenants could provide for each other. The owner, it says here, he's gone away to another country. He's traveling. He's doing business. He's got something else going on. He wants to maximize his earning potential and the fruitfulness of his land. And so he, he enters into a covenant, a contract with some people. I tell you what, here's my land. I prepped it for you. You work it. We're going to split the profits. And there were places and times during Jesus' day when the owner would, would only take 60%. And he would allow the tenants to take 40%. Could you imagine being uh, uh, poor with no way to make a living? Uh, uh, you, you didn't know how you were going to improve your station or whatever. And some wealthy landowner says, I tell you what, I've set you up for success. Uh, whatever you reap from my land, you get to keep 40%. I mean, you would think they would just jump at the chance. And they did. And they did. And so at the time when the harvest came, the owner sends a servant and ask for what rightfully belongs to him, and he will allow his tenants to keep what they had agreed to in the beginning. And so there are expectations here. There are expectations. Faithfulness, right? Let's keep our contract. We've signed on the dotted line. Uh, I've made an investment in the corporation, and you've worked for me, but I'm going to do profit sharing, and you're going to keep almost half of what you make. And so there would be an incentive for the workers to work all the more. Right? This is not socialism. This is capitalism in a way. Right? You work. You, you put the effort in, and I will be just and right with you to pay you a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. And then there's uh, fidelity, of course. Let's honor our agreement. Let's be faithful to each other. I've made you a pledge. You've made me a pledge back. Uh, we're going to be just and right in each other's eyes. And then let's respect our, our positions uh, in this contract. So we're not on equal terms. We're in different places. I'm the owner. I've made the investment. I will continue to act like the owner. And I will continue to reap the benefits of the owner. And, and you, if you, if you would be so kind, understand your position. I.e., you're not the owner. That's basically it. I'm the owner. You're not the owner. And then we'll just move forward from there. 
So the application for mankind in general is we should be faithful. We're called to be faithful to our creator. We're called to live in obedience to him. We're called to live in harmony with his revealed will. He is the owner of all things. He is worthy to receive from us our love, our affection, and he has been faithful, and he calls us then to fidelity, that we're to have him alone as our only true master. He's to be our God and to be our Lord, and we're to serve him only. And specifically for the Jews at this time. So this has to do with humanity in general, in Jesus' day for the Jews, and it has to do with the church and individual Christians today. Okay? So the application, faithfulness, fidelity, honor, give God his glory, uh, love him and serve him in all ways, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This whole, this whole idea of coming under the covenant rule of our high king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there it is. That's set up. There's the context. He's talking out of Isaiah 5. It's a warning. It's in the midst of a judgment. It's in the midst of this uh, Passover time. Thousands of people. And he begins that way. And I guarantee those men knew exactly what he was saying, as they say at the very end of the passage. And now you're going to see how do wicked men, how do wicked men handle that situation? How is their heart revealed? What does Jesus accuse them of because he knows their hearts and minds in this moment? And look at verse 3. And they took him. This is the tenants taking the servant that the owner had sent. And they took the servant of the owner and they beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he, the owner, sent to them, the tenants, another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he, the owner, sent another servant, and him, the tenants, killed, and so on, with many others. Some they beat, and some they killed. And as Jesus talks to the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the clans of Israel, he is accusing them of mistreating the servants of God Almighty. And all you need to do is pick up this book and read how that happened time and again. So under the, the judges and under the kings of Israel, they might be on a good king, followed by a bad king, followed by a good king, followed by a bad or a good king, bad king, good king, bad king. All sinners, even David, but none acting faithfully and righteously to the Lord or to the prophets that the Lord sent to refine and to rebuke and to, to uh, speak the word of God to the people of God. So what is in the heart of man in terms of the parable? There is wickedness. Only a desire for self and power and control. And if somebody will serve our purposes, we will allow them to participate with us, but only so far. And if they mess up the status quo, we will get rid of them, represented by beating or killing or sending away empty-handed. And so there's wickedness, there's theft, there's greed in the heart of men, even on the highest religious level, even the highest level in terms of God's covenant community. And Jesus, as the mediator, has now come on the scene to rectify and bring an end to that unfaithfulness and that unrighteousness. And it's not just wickedness, theft, and greed. It is arrogance and pride and vanity. There's a disregard for the Lord, the owner. 
in which he is entrusting uh, he, you know, this, this task to his servants. You know, he doesn't have to come back from the far country to execute his business. He has a trustworthy servant. He trusts these people to do exactly what he has told them to do. They, they represent him in the moment as surely as the prophets of old and Christians in today's society and the church are to take exactly what God has said and to execute that as clearly and uh, uh, purposefully um, and faithfully as possible. Because th this is the instruction from the owner of the vineyard. And yet, unbelievers, the world, or even people in the religious community who are without faith, yet they have power are not interested in receiving from the mouth of the owner instruction and a call to uh, fidelity. So it goes so far in the, in the parable, uh, beating, sending away empty-handed. We're not going to pay up. Uh, we're going to take over, and we're going to mistreat anybody that the owner sends from now on. We don't want to hear from you. Your, your persona non grata, don't come back here anymore. They deal with people shamefully. Uh, they strike people on the head. And then it gets down to the very end, they kill people. So the, the owner and the master keep sending person after person after person. And they are dealt with terribly. There is an escalation of violence. There is an escalation of wickedness. There is no limit to the wickedness that these tenants desire to perpetrate on the people who represent the owner. So I want you to see that. Jesus is saying to the religious leaders in the temple on a Tuesday before his crucifixion, I see your heart. There is no limit to the violence you have in your heart and the wickedness that you are capable of. And I have historical record if you want to talk about it. So is he duped by these men? Is he ignorant about what they're getting ready to do to him? And the answer is absolutely not. And so he then carries on with his story. So verse 6 to 8. The owner, he had still one other, a beloved son. And finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Once again, Jesus is proclaiming his own death ahead of time. If you read those verses and you don't see exactly what's going to happen to Jesus at the end of this week, look a little harder, dig a little deeper, ask the Lord to enlighten your heart and mind. He is telling these men, look, this is what's in your heart. This is what's in your heart. God, the owner, is going to send his most beloved treasure, his own son, to get what he wants. What does God the Father really want? Does he want grapes? <laughs> Maybe, but not merely. He wants to capture in the most gracious and loving way his people. The people that he has called into fellowship with him. There's a reason why Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. It's a heartbreaking situation. He is calling, Jesus is calling these men. Don't do this. Don't be like the men in this parable. Don't be like these tenants. God, the owner, is sending messengers to you to preach to you, to call you into obedience, to, for you to repay what is rightfully due 
for his glory and honor is the owner, but also you're contracted to him in this way. Pay it out of love and respect. And yet, and yet, the tenants say to one another, this is the heir, come let us kill him. I want you to see the kindness of God in this story as well. If you had a business and you set it up for success and you hired an office manager to to run the business and to keep the books, um, and you went out of the country for a while, and at some point you may say, "Hey, we need to uh, we need a CPA to come in and just do a little audit and figure out what's going on." I'm hoping I'm going to have at least you know five percent return on my investment, and we're paying all the bills and all this. And what if the CPA came back and said? Or what if the CPA got, that you, got, you sent into your business got beat up by the office manager and run off and said, don't come back here. I am not letting you check out the books. Now, if you were the business owner, what would you naturally do? <laughs> uh, sheriff? <laughs> yes, I, I own the business uh, in Lincolnton. And I just sent uh, one of my servants over there, somebody I've hired, and they have got accosted. Would you go check that out for me and rectify that situation? But the business owner, or this owner of the vineyard in this story, who represents God, doesn't do that. It's a real oddity. It's a real strange part of this parable. And what Jesus is telling these religious leaders as God the Father has been very long-suffering over a very long time with you. He could have come immediately and rectified the situation. He could have brought an end to this bad behavior right at the point that it occurred, but he does not. His long-suffering patience then is often looked at as weakness, but what looks like weakness in God is just patience. It's just patience. God, in this parable, the owner, actually thinks better of the tenants than they actually deserve. And he holds out hope and opportunity for repentance and time to change and to correct their ways. And if you look historically, this is over uh, decades and centuries and millennia. And if you look in terms of all of history, God is patiently, in the age of grace, giving all men an opportunity to repent and come to Jesus. Not because we're strong and he's afraid of us. He's tender and kind and compassionate and takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that people would repent and come back into fellowship with him. So the Lord is kind and generous and, and grateful. It costs his servants sometimes their life or their health. But the Lord has hope and patience. And so as he sends his son, what, does, what do they do? Do they think, oh, well, this is the son. They're, they respect me, right? No. The escalation reaches its highest point. Look at verse 7. The tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So there is a plotting, there's a planning, there's a scheming. It is in conjunction with each other. They have a meeting. They get together, and they have an interaction. And they're like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Let's come up with, a, let's come up with the, the supreme plan right now. This is the last servant that's coming. It's the guy that's going to get the vineyard. Should we pay? Should we finally relent? 
And what they come up with collectively in a premeditated way is, ah, let's murder this guy. The father says, this is my beloved son. And the tenants say, let's kill him. That is in the heart of man. And let me be pastoral. That's in your heart as a sinner. Ask for the Lord to restrain you. The, the, the enmity that is between humanity and God would not flare up in, in you, that your old man would not have power over you. But that's one of those things that you, you want to crucify your flesh. You want to kill it with gospel teaching. You want to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, let me not be like this because it's lurking and looming in me and can give rise at any moment. So they plot and they plan and they scheme and they murder. It's a short-sighted understanding of reality. If the tenants kill the heir, do the tenants get the vineyard? Why not? Why not? They just said that. Ah, the inheritance will be ours. Who'd they forget about? The owner. The owner. The guy who actually owns the vineyard, right? Do you see how short-sighted sin is? Adam and Eve, look at that fruit. Wow. If we have that fruit, guess what? We run the universe. Right? Uh-uh. That's not going to happen. The, the real owner is still around. All you have done is been short-sighted and foolish and blind and ignorant. God is not going to abdicate his throne, and he cannot be usurped. He is the only true and real sovereign. And so wisdom would be, if you're the tenant, to say, Master, I desire to show myself approved in your vineyard. Will you help me? Will you show me? Will you teach me? And that should be in exactly the mindset of the religious leaders as they stood in the temple talking to the Son of God. Sir, we have done wickedly, and we have been treacherous in our treatment of other people. Forgive me. Teach me. Train me. But when you're short-sighted and blinded by the devil, all you want and have is murderous intentions. Despite the fact that God has been gracious, he set you up for success. Physically, spiritually, relationally. The fact that he's been long-suffering. He doesn't repay us uh, according to our sins. But he delights in mercy. He gives multiple chances at reform and repentance. He gives us the benefit of the doubt. He knows what's true, but he gives us uh, an opportunity because he always hopes. He always perseveres. He always loves. Get into 1 Corinthians 13 and begin to think, how in the world does the Lord love me? He loves me like this. And he offers his beloved. The beloved of the father, the beloved of the vineyard owner is standing in the temple in that moment and offers himself to his people. And so what is the conclusion of the matter? What will be the conclusion of the matter when people oppose Jesus Christ and stand in opp opposition to the plan and trajectory of all history? Look at verses 9 through 11. Jesus asks the Religious leaders in that moment. What will the owner of the vineyard do? This is after they kill the son and they throw him out of the vineyard like he is discarded as a piece of trash. Jesus says, what will the owner of the vineyard do? 
And here comes the answer in the parable. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Don't think that God's patience is weakness. This is Jesus, the prophet, saying judgment will fall. The ax is laid at the tree, so to speak. Verse 10, have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He starts off the parable speaking out of Isaiah 5, calling those religious leaders and us today to get in line with God's revealed will and to understand with wisdom what God is like and how he acts and behaves uh, and how he executes both exaltation and judgment uh, on people. And now Jesus, at the end, comes and quotes Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. Wait, if you'll put that one up there. This is what Jesus says. Again, these religious leaders and everybody in the temple that's listening, we're going to get in this right here. Like this is, this is not some obscure passage. And this is what he says. He says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And Jesus is saying, Do you understand what's happening in this moment? As you plot to arrest me and kill me. And in other words, what he's saying is, I understand in this parable that I am the beloved son sent to the tenants who should open their doors wide to me and bring me in and set a feast before me and respect me and love me and fellowship with me and delight in the, the communal aspect of our relationship. And this covenant that we have is mere contractual. It should be relational. And Jesus is saying, but I know what you're going to do. It is my time. And you will arrest me. And you will tell lies about me. And you will gain permission from the Romans to beat me, abuse me, to mock me, to shame me, to crucify me. And in the words of the parable, throw me like a piece of discarded trash out of the vineyard. But I am the stone that you have rejected. In fact, I'm not just a stone. I am the most important piece in this whole building. And I will be exalted and I will be magnified. And though the builders, when they're looking through the stones to find the right one, and they say, no, not that stone, and they look through all the other stones, the master craftsman, who knows more than any of the other builders, will come and find me and say, that one, that's the one. This is the one who holds all things Together, It will be the most beautiful part of this whole building. And who's going to do it? The Lord is going to do it. There is no way to stand in opposition to what the Lord has decided to do with his Christ. No religious leader. No institution, no government, not time, not the devil, not angelic beings, not your frailties, not your self-exaltation. There is nothing and no one in all creation who is going to keep Jesus from being exalted as king and lord over all. Amen? Amen? And therefore... If we're standing in the temple at that moment, we would say, glory, hallelujah, 
be my king. I will serve you with everything I have till my last dying breath because you are the beloved son and you were meant to take your place on the throne. The cross looms near on that Tuesday in the temple. And the chief priests and the scribes and the elders thought they had the upper hand. Let's get rid of this guy. So the cross looms near. But so does the resurrection. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, there's, a, there's a convicting element to this. How do we treat those who preach the word of God to us? How do we treat your word? Do we think that we're in control of parts and pieces of your rule over us? Do we rebuke you or uh, act ignorant towards the things you say? Or do we fall directly in line with what you called us to do? And we pray for the grace, O oh Lord, to believe that whatever you have said about Jesus, you will accomplish it. You will establish his kingdom over all. And the resurrection is proof positive that you, will, you are carrying out your plan, not only of redemption, but in the restoration of all things. So, Lord Jesus, you are the stone that the builders rejected, but you are now the cornerstone. And we rejoice that this was the Lord's doing. And may we serve you all the days of your life as you enable us by your word and by your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name.